tonight on Y News. The Senate moves to revoke the passport of retired police Wally Sombero and cites him in contempt. The PNP anti-kidnapping group sets to release next week the result of its investigation on the G-Kidnap Slay case. The Philippine National Police prioritizes the capture of NDFP consultants. Three suspects were arrested in Manila for falsification of import documents. Bolivia allocates more than half a million dollars to combat a plague of locust. And a dream collection of vintage cars are up for auction in Paris, France. Why News begins now. From the UNTV News and Rescue Command Center, this is Why News with Angelo Castro III and Darlene Basingan. Good evening. Retired Police Superintendent Wally Sombero might be forced to return to the country and attend the Senate hearing on the Jack Lamb bribery scandal. Joyce Palancho will tell us why. The Senate will ask the Department of Foreign Affairs or DFA to revoke or cancel the passport of retired police superintendent Wally Sompero following his third absence in the Senate probe on the issue of Jack Lamb bribery scandal. So he will come back. That's very severe. Huh? because he cannot stay in a country without a passport. Uh, and the reason for that is we've been trying to get in touch with him and we think that he's really trying to avoid uh, the processes of the Senate. Sombero's lawyer, attorney Ted Contacto, explains that his client intended to fly back to the country from Canada to attend today's hearing. However, he was not able to do so because of a health problem. Uh, he did board the flight last uh, February 7. But uh, he was refused. He had uh, palpitations and the uh, issue was shut up. Committee Chair Senator Richard Gordon asked Attorney Contacto to submit to the Senate his client's medical certificate as proof. However, until the last minute of the hearing earlier, nothing was submitted to the committee. Senator Gordon then moved to cite Sombero in contempt. During the hearing, the Bureau of Immigration was also asked to explain how did Sombero manage to leave the country while being placed under a lookout bulletin. Wally Sombero is known to be a lecturer at the Immigration Commission, correct? Yes, Your Honor, but uh, he's not at uh, the airport. Dahil siya ay nagdadala ng maraming mga bisita dito, lalo na yung mga galing sa China. Tama po ba yan? Yes, Your Honor, but uh, he's not at uh, the airport. Dahil siya ay nagdadala ng maraming mga bisita dito, lalo na yung mga galing sa China. Tama po ba yan? I uh, believe so, Your Honor. Kina po, maubos usipin na dahil siya'y kilala, kilala niya ang maraming tao sa Commission on Immigration. Tama po ba yan? Yes, Your Honor. But so, I cannot speak. So, paano po makakalusot si Wally samantalang si Wences daw ang lumabas? Iisang tao lang po yun. The lookout bulletin specified the name Wally Sombero. Uh, but when he presented his passport, it was Wences daw Sombero. But... Uh, while he admits that Sombero asked permission from him to seek medical attention abroad, Secretary Aguirre holds the immigration responsible for letting him leave. Under the operating procedure that in the event like this, where the said uh, name Wally Sombrero is very near with Wenceslao Sombero, it is, should be a matter of uh, SOP for them to stop uh, his... Uh, uh, is leaving. The two officers who allegedly processed Sombero's departure have already been suspended from office. Meanwhile, the Senate hearing will be continued on February 16. And according to Committee Chair Senator Richard Gordon, if Wally Sombero finally attends, this might be the last session of the Senate the Ribbon Committee on the issue of the Jack Lamb bribery scandal. Joyce Balancho, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. The PNP anti-kidnapping group is set to release the result of its investigation into the GHU kidnap slay case next week. Lea Ilagan will tell us why. PNP 
PNPAKG Director Police Senior Superintendent Glenn Dumlao says the PNP anti-kidnapping group is set to release next week the result of the investigation of the NBI PNP Task Force into the GQ kidnap slay case. The task force has already completed its investigation which found that more suspects are in fact involved in the crime. The police official however refuses to provide further details on the matter. Next week, may comply namin at may bigyan na namin yung referral. Gusto na dagdagan mo? Sa course ng investigation namin, may mga dagdag. Dumlao adds that they will also investigate other cases of kidnapping of foreign nationals across the country as there are indications that a group or certain personalities linked to each other are committing the crimes. Itong ginagawa nila is actually victimizing the Korean community and even the Chinese community, yung mga foreigners na napupunta rito and even the Indians. So yun lang talaga ang porte nila. So extortion hanggang ngayon sa pananakot ng extortion and kaya bumibigay. The police official meanwhile denied the existence of Korean mafia noting that GHU case is just an isolated one. However, he admits that there are individuals copying the style of Korean mafia on how to abduct and extort money. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue Camp Krame. The Armed Forces of the Philippines welcomes the Department of Justice's probe on the alleged special treatment at the military detention facilities. Brian De Paz will tell us why. The Armed Forces of the Philippines is open to the Department of Justice's plan to investigate the alleged special treatment given to high-profile inmates at the AFP detention facility. These following orders of investigation from Justice Secretary Vitaliano Aguirre due to reports that some inmates at the AFP Custodial and Detention Center get special privileges. But AFP Chief of Staff General Eduardo Año says there is no way illegal items would get into the military facility given the tight security. We have a security survey inspection. This is done periodically to ensure that all facilities are safe from any espionage or any uh, security compromise and to ensure that no illegal activity is happening inside the detention cell of high-profile inmates, AFP will collaborate with the Philippine National Police in conducting a joint investigation. So yung portion na yun, as part of our job, we made some uh, observations and uh, uh, investigations and uh, inspection uh, and the, the appropriate measure or course of action uh, will be through the the proper authority like uh, the uh, Bucor and the uh, DOJ. Granting that it is true, uh, we will uh, investigate and uh, we will determine uh, up to what extent yung kanilang influence over doon sa uh, control ng pagpasok, kung meron mang naipasok na mga kontraband doon sa loob ng facility na yan. Brian De Paz, UNTV News and Rescue, Camp Aguinaldo. The armed forces recovered high-caliber firearms and other suspected equipment of the Abu Sayyaf group in an encounter in Sulu. Ray Palayo will tell us why. The armed forces of the Philippines joined task force Sulu's search for Abu Sayyaf's group sub-leader Al-Habsi Misaya continues. Military forces encountered Misaya's group last Tuesday in Sicho Talok Talok Kapual Island in Sulu. Eight ASG members were killed including Kara Kinod, Asbiali Ihiram, Bari Raba, and Hassan Angkong who all had warrants of arrests. During a clearing operation at the encounter site, the AFP recovered eight high-caliber firearms, ammunition, explosives, assorted camouflage, digital uniforms, and other equipment. Um, meron tayong progress report na natanggap from the operating troops na um, may pang pangalawang encounter na nangyari after they conduct the pursuit operation to the group. At yun nga, may nakuha silang walong body count lahat, walong katawan ng uh, Abu Sayyaf members. The AFP has intensified its naval blockage and maritime security patrol around the island to prevent Misaya's group from escaping. The armed forces is confident in neutralizing the ASG within the six-month deadline set by Malacanang. It is not just a, a, a success of the Western Mindanao Command but also a success of the 
entire armed forces of the Philippines and of course the Philippine Filipino nation kasi common enemy naman natin itong uh, Abu Sayyaf group Ray Pilayo UNTV News and Rescue Philippines a joint letter directive has been signed today between the Armed Forces of the Philippines and the Philippine National Police. Marge Pelayo will tell us why. The Armed Forces of the Philippines and the Philippine National Police agreed to further strengthen the country's security. In a joint letter directive signed today by AFP Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Eduardo Año and PNP Chief Director General Ronald De La Rosa, they agreed to conduct joint cell force training or the sharing of knowledge and skills between soldiers and policemen. The agreement states that the trainings soldiers undergo can also be taught to cops. So we have a joint training with PNP and uh, AFP. Uh, as well as the PNP can attend to the regular courses of the AP training institution and vice versa. Para yung interoperability namin ay uh, may cohesion. The military chief explains that the actions of the armed forces and the national police should always match since law enforcement and internal security operations are linked. Both officials believe that through cooperation, the government's capability in addressing crime, corruption and terrorism in the country would further improve. Kailangan palaging in unison yung galaw ng PNP at saka AP so we can have a safe and secure protected ride. In union, there is strength. That's it. March Pelayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. The Makabayan Group has submitted a resolution calling on President Rodrigo Duterte to reconsider the resumption of peace talks with the National Democratic Front of the Philippines. Nel Maribohok will tell us why. The Makabayan Bloc has gathered more than 100 signatures from lawmakers of the House of Representatives. This is to support the resolution that the group has filed today appealing to President Rodrigo Duterte to rethink his decision of suspending the peace talks with the National Democratic Front of the Philippines. According to the Vice Chairman of the House Committee on Peace, Reconciliation and Unity and Bayan Muna Representative Carlos Sarate, the resolution aims to send to President Duterte their sentiments for the continuation of peace negotiations. To uh, give the sense of the House no, na uh, kay Pangulong Digong, mapaabot yung mensahe kay Pangulong Digong especially na gustong-gusto natin na maituloy pa ang usaping pangkapayapaan. On the other hand, Anak Pawis Party List Representative Ariel Casilo says the resumption of talks will be hard if the Joint Agreement on Safety and Immunity Guarantees or JASIG has already been terminated. Sino ang makakausap ng GRP if lahat ng mga consultants ay under threat for arrest? No? JASIG was signed in 1995 and serves as the participant's safeguard from arrest, detention or any similar punitive actions. The lawmakers are hoping that the president will consider the developments in the past three rounds of talks and will pursue negotiations with the rebel group. Nel Maribuhok, UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. The PNP Criminal Investigation and Detection Group is now prioritizing the capture or capture of NDFP consultants after President Duterte has ordered their arrest. Lea Ilagan will tell us why. Members of the Criminal Investigation and Detection Group or CIDG are now searching for the NDFP consultants. This after President Rodrigo Duterte ordered their arrest. PNP CIDG Chief Police Director Ruel Obusan says locating the whereabouts of the NDFP consultants is now their priority even though there's no time frame given to them for the arrest of the members of the communist group. Those subjected for arrest include couple Wilma and Benito Chamson, Vic Ladlad, Adelberto Silva and Tirso Alcantara. Kahit hindi nag-set ng deadline ng ating presidente, Pagka ang chief executive ang nagsabi, it is always a priority. So kapag ka priority, most of our efforts eh, will be concentrated. 
The police official says that although the PNP does not expect them to surrender, he is still calling on the NDF consultant to just cooperate with authorities to avoid violence. He adds that the CIDG and the armed forces of the Philippines are now coordinating for the immediate arrest of the said NDF consultants. He also urges rebel officials to cooperate with the government to attain long-lasting peace. Hanggat mayroong conflict between armed struggle of different political ideologies, hindi titino ang bansa natin. Not for our generation, but for generations to come. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue Cam Karame. The National Democratic Front of the Philippines, or NDFP, has refused to accept the so-called unjust termination of the Joint Agreement on Safety and Immunity Guarantees, or JASIG, by the government. In a statement released by the NDFP, Chief Negotiator Fidel Agawili asserts that there is no just reason for the Duterte administration to issue this after the successful third round of peace talks in Rome, Italy. Agawili pointed out that there are several technical errors in the notice of termination released by the Office of the Presidential Advisor on the Peace Process that were not properly addressed to the National Executive Committee of the NDFP. Vice President Lenny Robredo urges House Deputy Speakers to stand by their position on the proposed reinstatement of that penalty. Grace Cassin will tell us why. After House Speaker Pantalon Alvarez threatened to remove all deputy speakers who would oppose the reinstatement of death penalty, Vice President Lenny Robredo in a press briefing today has urged all deputy speakers to defend their stand on the issue. Ito yung chance nila para, para ipakita kung ano yung mas mahalaga. Ano yung mas mahalaga sa kanila to hold on to their positions o panindigan yung kanilang paniniwala. At present, LP doesn't have any party stand on the issue of death penalty. However, she confirmed that LP had a meeting two weeks ago to rebuild their party. They will start the rebuilding in the provinces where there are still LP members. Ang direksyon ngayon, babalik, babalik sa mga dating kasamahan sa mga sektor. At papalakasin ulit yung, yung, yung sectoral membership ng Liberal Party. Grace Kassin, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Three suspects have been arrested in Manila for falsification of import documents. The Bureau of Customs says the government is losing hundreds of millions in taxes with these models. Roderick Mendoza will tell us why. The National Bureau of Investigation arrested three suspects in separate operations in Recto Area, Manila over fake import documents. The suspects were identified as Ofelia Oliave, Jocelyn Amancio, and Ruben Flores, who are now facing criminal complaints. The Bureau of Customs sought the assistance of NBI after it discovered that the suspects were faking AFTA or ASEAN Free Trade Area certificates and selling them for 6,000 pesos per set. According to the Customs Bureau, the government is losing hundreds of millions in duties and taxes every month due to fake AFTA certificates. Nakapag ito po ay ginamit sa, sa pagpaproseso uh, sa ating Bureau of Customs ay hindi po sila magbabayad ng tamang duties and taxes. Ang worst doon, yung ibang uh, commodity po pwedeng hindi na po sila talaga magbayad ng anumang duties and taxes. Australia says there is a big possibility that the fake documents will not be detected considering the thousands of transactions the Bureau is processing each day. Ang tingin namin dito, nationwide ginagamit to kaya malaking bagay po na madiskubre natin to at uh, inadress po natin to na mabilisan. Expect namin marami pa dyan. Uh, we just conducted an, an initial step pero after this, we will be conducting more investigation and test by the customs will also seek the assistance of other countries, particularly to enhance the security features of the certificates. Baka po pwede natin dagdagan yung security features ng ating dokumento para talaga hindi na po ito makopya. The Bureau will also look into the possibility that some of their people are conniving with the suspects. Importers found to be using fake import documents will also be charged and their accreditation will be revoked. Roderick Mendoza, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. 
Environment Secretary Gina Lopez is leaving it up to President Rodrigo Duterte to decide on the implementation of the closure order against the 23 non-compliant mining operations. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. Environment Secretary Gina Lopez remains firm that she had followed the rule of law when she decided to order the closure of 23 non-compliant mining operations and suspend other five more. The Secretary says in observance of the law, she will continue to be against mineral extractions inside watersheds and it is non-negotiable. I mean, it will take a miracle to be able to convince me to allow mining in watersheds because as far as I know, it's against the law. You know, it's against social justice, it's against the Constitution to allow any kind of extractive industry inside a watershed. However, the Secretary will let the President decide on the implementation of the closure order against the said operations. At the end of the day, he, he makes the decisions okay. and uh, in, in the Cabinet meeting, uh, his last closing remark in front of everyone, we say, I, I agree no? okay. that there shouldn't be any mining industry in watersheds. Let's see, you know, politics is so unpredictable, Dima. Right? For now, mining operations of involved companies still continue, pending the decision of President Duterte on their appeal. They can also raise the issue to the Supreme Court if the President decides against their favor. Secretary Lopez admitted that she will be quite sad if President Duterte decides otherwise. However, she said this is not enough reason for her to quit her post. Meanwhile, DNR has already released detailed and official report on the violations of the involved mining companies. Secretary Gina also stresses that her office is open if any mining firm would like to look at the detailed reports of the mining audit. Everything, they can come to my office. I will also give them boiled peanuts. <laughs> and if they behave, I might give them some ice cream. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanang. Senator Bong Revilla Jr. asked the Sandigan Bayan to dismiss his plunder case and instead change it to a simple case of bribery. Monokson will tell us why. For the second time, the draft court deferred the trial of the plunder case of former Senator Ramon Bong Revilla Jr. This is due to the motion to quash filed by his legal counsel, Attorney Estelito Mendoza. Based on the motion, the information on charge against Revilla does not constitute a plunder offense. There is also no series of overt criminal acts committed by Revilla and his co-accused Richard Cambe. Revilla's endorsement of NGOs to Napoles is considered as innocent acts and accusations against the former senator amount to just an offense of simple bribery and not plunder. An endorsement is not a criminal act. An endorsement is required by the rules. It cannot be considered an overt criminal act. But the law requires that the ill-gotten wealth must be, really must be acquired through an overt criminal act. The prosecution replied and said that the motion to dismiss is just a tactic to delay the case. Revilla cannot claim that his right to be informed of accusations was violated since he petitioned for bail before. The fact that the court already denied the bail petition of Senator Revilla and that the court declared that our evidence of guilt is strong for plunder is a confirmation of the validity of the information. But Mendoza said that filing a motion is not prohibited and can be done anytime. Revilla refused to comment on the case and just informed the media that his father is in good condition after undergoing a heart surgery. Meanwhile, the court canceled the arraignment of former Comelec Chairman Benjamin Abalos over the anomalous purchase of two service vehicles in 2003. Abalos filed a motion for reconsideration after the court dismissed his motion to quash. The arraignment is set on April 27, 2017. Mon Hoxon, UNTV News and Rescue, Sandigan Bayan. Certain groups are urging the government to probe the alleged corruption in Philippine sports. Aga Kaakbay will tell us why. Volunteer Against Crime and Corruption, or VACC, and the Philippine Swimming League call on the government to look into the alleged corruption in the Philippine sports system. Kami po ay sa ating gobyerno, lalo na sa Kongreso, 
na magkaroon ng inquiry, congressional inquiry in aid of legislation to investigate the various anomalies by various national sports association in the Philippines under the Philippine Olympic Committee. Recently, I understand nagkaroon sila ng eleksyon. Naging issue po yan. Hindi nakalabas po sa attention ng VACC. Na dito pala sa sports, ay katakot-takot din po ang political patronage. Grabe din po talaga ang gimmickan dito as far as corruption is concerned. The VACC chief also claims that provincial games are becoming a source of corruption, as well wherein managers of the games collect membership dues and funds for sports uniforms. Furthermore, he argues that although there is a sport development fund for Filipino athletes, the country has never won any gold medal in the Olympics and still lags behind rankings in the ASEAN sports events. Jimenez believes the government should investigate the matter, especially since the SEA Games is drawing near which will be held in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Meanwhile, the Philippine Swimming League also criticizes the Philippine Sports Commission's system in selecting athletes for sports events outside of the country. It is the system that we are asking to be changed, to be one word, inclusive, and another word, democratized. It must be open to all, no matter what organization you belong. Papa says issuing Philippine passports to foreigners so they could represent the country in sports events abroad is a form of deception. She also calls for the conduct of a national tryout that would serve as a basis for choosing players who will represent the country. Agak Akbayo NTV News and Rescue, Manila. The Department of Trade and Industry aims at strengthening the country's micro and small to medium enterprises in the upcoming ASEAN 2017 Summit. John Nano will tell us why. The Philippines' hosting of the ASEAN 2017 is expected to help strengthen the country's ties with other Asian nations. Through this, the Department of Trade and Industry, or DTI, says the Philippines can encourage more investors and thus create more jobs for Filipinos. It will provide more opportunities, trabaho. Katulad ng tinutulak ng Department of Trade and Industry, sa pag, the more we promote ganitong economic activities, mas masigla, mas adaming investment, mas adami ang trabaho. So, mas marami opportunity. Or, mas madadami ang negosyo na opportunity din. Yung mga maliliit na negosyante, makapag-umpisa sila, makakabenta sila sa labas. Thus, the DTI has laid down the agenda for the ASEAN Summit this year. This included strengthening of micro, small and medium enterprises in ASEAN member countries and the discussions on the modern ways of conducting business through technology. The discussions aim to improve trade and commerce among ASEAN countries to further develop their economies. Ating mga maliliit na mga, uh, na mga negosyante ay may opportunity na ipakita sa kanila at mag-participate sa ganitong mga okasyon upang makapag-link up sila doon sa mga malalaking negosyante sa iba't ibang bansa ng ASEAN at maka, ma, makatuto, ma, matuto sila ng best practices. Various ASEAN meetings have already been held in the country after the Philippines launched its chairmanship of the Regional Block Summit last January 15. Joan Nano, UNC Venus and Rescue, Makati City. The Land Transportation Office may already have a solution to fake medical certificates being submitted to their agency. Victor Cosare will tell us why. The Land Transportation Office Region 11 has been chosen as the pilot area for the online transmission of medical certificates to address anomalies in the submission of such requirement to the agency in securing a license. This means that a person no longer has to bring a hard copy of the document to the LTO, but instead, the medical clinics will send the certificate directly to the agency. manual acceptance medical certificate. So from the doctor, ng aplikante ang iyang hard copy to the, to the LTO Licensing Center. Ang naitabuan ni Karon, dagan ang atong mga nadakpan nga nagbaligya o mga fake o pre-signed medical certificate is gawas. 
Medical clinics need to register to the LTO's IT system to get an accreditation. And to ensure that the medical certificates that reach the LTO are legitimate, the doctor has to signify his or her biometrics or thumb mark before sending the data. If the clinic is involved in an anomaly or will not perform the proper checkup on a person, LTO will take the proper action to address it. A blacklist na to sila. I-report na to sa PMA ng Philippine Medical Association and then i-blacklist na to sila from practicing as physician. With this system, the public will also be paying less for a medical certificate which will just cost them 280 pesos from 400. This will also be implemented all over the country in the coming days. Meanwhile, LTO Region 11 assures the people of Davao Region that the more than 70,000 backlogs for the licensed cards will be addressed until June of this year. Victor Cosare, UNTV News and Rescue, Davao City. The government will allocate billions of pesos if the Philippine Space Agency will be created upon passing a bill. Ray Pelayo will tell us why. The Department of Science and Technology or DOST is preparing for the possible establishment of a space agency in the country. Secretary Fortunato de la Peña said a bill has already been drafted that will create the Philippine Space Agency. The department is pushing it to be a priority bill for its immediate approval. De La Peña says it will be a big help in the risk reduction and monitoring of climate change, natural resources, agriculture, and security. The state-owned space agency would also capacitate the country to launch a rocket ship that will bring satellites into space. The Philippines already has the Wata-1 microsatellite, but it was launched through the help of Japan and NASA. Uh, so we are, we are still actually uh, developing our human resources that will really do the job. No? So we do not have a ready pool of um, space uh, technology experts. A portion of DOST's research and development fund goes to the study of creating a space agency. Once established, 24 billion pesos will be allotted for a period of 10 years, wherein 2 billion pesos is immediately set aside for 2018. Meanwhile, the House Committee on Science and Technology is consolidating bills for the Balik Scientist program. It has already been approved in the committee level and is to be submitted for a reading at the plenary. This will give opportunities for Filipino scientists who wish to return to the country. They have to uh, be able to identify which particular institution or sector they will be able to help before we approve their coming home and what exactly they will do. Ray Pelayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Pasig City. Bolivia allocates more than half a million dollars to combat a plague of locusts that has been destroying crops. R.C. Reyes will tell us why. Bolivian President Evo Morales on Wednesday said he would allocate more than $700,000 to combat a locust plague that has already damaged more than 1,000 hectares of crops in the southern Bolivian province of Santa Cruz. Farmers, Santa Cruz authorities, and Bolivia's National Service of Agricultural Health and Food Safety, Senasag, are in the area to implement a contingency plan to control the pest in the affected areas. The crops affected by the pest are corn, sorghum, peanut, grazing livestock, and to a lesser extent, soybeans, according to the Eastern Agricultural Chamber, or CAO. Local media reports that authorities fear the locusts could spread within a radius of 10 kilometers per day and therefore decided to fund strong pesticide efforts to defeat the locust. Morales says he would visit the affected area on Friday, February 10th, to supervise the work as he announced the phytosanitary emergency and allocation of government funds. De emergencia, esta madrugada en el gabinete hemos decidido emitir un decreto supremo. Se autoriza al Ministerio de Economía y Finanzas Públicas realizar el traspaso presupuestario interinstitucional con recursos del Tesoro General de la Nación por un monto de 5.329.629 bolivianos a favor del Ministerio de Desarrollo Rural de Tierras para atender la emergencia fitosanitaria declarada por el SENASAC e implementar el plan de contingencia de control de la langosta voladora en las áreas afectadas. The locust's destructive power stems from its gregarious nature that allows it to move in swarms, eating whatever vegetation it finds in its path. 
According to CAO data, the last locust invasion took place 25 years ago in the productive areas of Santa Cruz. Arce Reyes, UNTV News and Rescue, Latin America. The yellow fever outbreak is threatening the survival of a rare South American primate, primates, particularly in Brazil. Dave Tirao will tell us why. An outbreak of yellow fever has claimed the lives of more than 600 monkeys and dozens of humans in Brazil's Atlantic rainforest region, threatening the survival of rare South American primates. The monkeys, mostly brown howlers and mastitis, are falling out of trees and dying on the ground in the forest of Spiritu Santo State in Brazil's southeast. The howler's sounds closely resemble grunts or barks. It was the silence that fell on the forest that first alerted farmers that something was amiss, sparking specialists to investigate. The mastite is considered as vulnerable by the Swiss-based International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which has placed it on its red list of threatened species. No evidence has so far surfaced of the affliction felling woolly spider monkeys, considered one of the world's most endangered by the IUCN. Millions of Brazilians have been vaccinated as health authorities scramble to prevent the outbreak from turning into an epidemic. There is no such protection available for monkeys. Arthur Cotto, director of the Fio Cruz Institute in Rio de Janeiro, says vaccination efforts would be focused in Brazil's border regions where the outbreak is concentrated. Até agora, no início de fevereiro, em torno de 21 milhões, 21 milhões de doses de vacinas. Hoje, a estratégia do Ministério da Saúde está em concentrar, é, principalmente onde você tem um número de casos de febre amarela, que são as regiões fronteiriças, fronteiriças com as florestas, onde você tem um maior número de casos. Brazil's federal health officials are investigating if the latest outbreak is linked to a tailings dam collapse last year in Minas Gerais at the Samarco Iron Ore Mine co-owned by the BHB Billiton and Valley SA. The dam accident which polluted the Rio Doce River is regarded as the country's worst environmental disaster. Some scientists have said that calamity may have made the monkeys more susceptible to contracting yellow fever by decimating their habitat and food supplies. Dave Tirao, UNTV News and Rescue, Brazil. China is set to become the top organ transplant country in the world. Dulce Alarcón will tell us why. China will become the top country for organ transplants as a result of its technological developments, according to Dr. Huang Jiefu, a former vice health minister and an expert on organ transplantation. In an interview with CCTV on Tuesday at the Organ Trafficking Conference in the Vatican, Wang said that China is improving its national organ donation and transplantation systems. As the head of the country's organ donation and transplantation committee, he has called on the World Health Organization to take the lead in setting up a special committee to monitor organ transplantation in member countries. Recently, the Chinese government initiated reforms of the country's organ transplant system, such as starting a voluntary donation program. But public response remains tepid. Dr. Wang Haibu, Wang's colleague, proposed that the government should find its own path in meeting the standards of the international community. Dulce Alarcon, UNTV News and Rescue, Shanghai, China. The countdown clock starts ticking in South Korea. Meanwhile, Tiger Woods says he feels good but not great. Aaron Romero tells us why. In golf, former world number one Tiger Woods says he feels good but not great after undergoing three back surgeries and four knee surgeries. 
Woods, a 14 times major champion, has recently returned to action after a 15 month break from teeing off. The American golf star has racked up 79 PGA Tour victories in his career, but has not won a major championship since 2008. And in tennis, tennis star former world number one Maria Sharapova has been invited to compete at the Madrid Open in May, which happens several days after her 15-month doping ban ends. The five-star Grand Slam winner was handed a wild card to enter the event, which commences on May 5. This will be her second comeback tournament after her suspension. Meanwhile, South Korea holds a one-year countdown activity for the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games in Seoul, starting Wednesday, February 8, with 365 days to go until the opening ceremony happening on February 9, 2018. An eight-ton clock made by a sponsor of the international mega sports event was revealed during the countdown ceremony, which is to remain in place until March 20, 2018. Lee Hee Byung, president of the Pyeongchang Organizing Committee for the 2018 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games, says the organizing committee is making every effort to guarantee a successful hosting of the Winter Olympic Games. Pyeongchang Olympic 성공을 위해서는 다른 무엇보다도 선수들의 노력과 열정을 정확하게 측정하고 관리한 것이 매우 중요합니다. Pyeongchang 조직위원은 100만 분의 1초까지 측정하는 오메가의 기술과 함께 어, 완벽한 올림을 치를 수 있도록 최선을 다하겠습니다. Aaron Romero, UNTV News and Rescue, New York. Another UNTV Cup battle awaits Malacañang Kamao and BOC Transformers supporters on Sunday. Bernard Dades will tell us why. After several days of the UNTV Cup hard court, the BOC Transformers will head to a battle against the Malacanang Kamao. BOC assistant coach Bong De La Cruz admits despite being the number one team in the league this season, they have to prepare for the threat of Malacanang Kamao. We start kami sa practice namin to prepare for the semis. Every game naman, pinipilit namin manalo. So yung outcome, syempre, bahala na sa execution. And the BOC Transformers holds an 8-2 win-loss record after finishing strongly in the second round elimination last month and possesses a twice-to-beat advantage over the Kamaok team. On the other hand, the Malacanang team guarantees a pose a big challenge to the rookie team using their assets as a weapon. Kasi itong team naman ito, ang, ang pinakambigas asset namin talaga yung sipag eh, tsaka yung teamwork. Talaga sakripisyo. Alam namin na uh, we doubled the effort already entering this game. Siguro mas dodoblehin pa namin. The Kamal team with strong starters and a reliable bench is determined to double their effort to win. Yung big four nila napapagaling yung ibang mga kasama nila eh. So we need to, hindi, hindi naman namin masisiro yun eh. Pero nagawin lang namin yung lahat para at least ma-contain Okay, tapos uh, ayun, tulong-tulong pa rin. Hindi na hindi kaya nang hindi kaya na isa yan. Para talunin mo yung BOC, it needs to be a total team effort. Hindi lang yung naglalaro sa loob, pati yung mga nasa bench. If the Malacañang wins, they will face the Transformers again in a win or go home match. Prepare for the Transformers Kamao Clash on February 12, Sunday at 3 p.m., airing live on UNTV, emanating from Pasig City Sports Complex with live streaming via UNTVweb.com. Bernard Daddies for UNTV Cup Season 5. One of the largest collections of Alice in Wonderla Alice's Adventures in Wonderland memorabilia is being auctioned in Oxford, England. Zovic Burmas will tell us why. One of the biggest collections of Alice in Wonderland memorabilia that features over 3,000 items acquired by the late antiquarian book dealer Thomas Schuster and his wife Greta is to be auctioned in Oxford, United Kingdom. Bit by bit, um, we collected literally anything Alice, starting at the earliest uh, spin-offs or games, whatever, and working down to about 1970. We picked up things.
things that nobody else would probably be interested in. But we saw them for what they were. Highlights from the massive collection to be sold in 360 lots have been exhibited publicly on two previous occasions at the Schuster Gallery in the late 1900s and at the Tate Modern Liverpool in 2012 as part of an Alice in Wonderland exhibition that later moved to Italy and Germany. Alice was a very grown-up child in the stories. She questioned everything that was said to her. And uh, that is a child all over, isn't it, really? They question it all the time. Uh, oh, I think it was the sincerity of the stories, but the imagination of a child, which is fantastic. Greta Schuster chose to sell the collection in Oxford due to its close links with the Alice story. It was famously during a boat trip on the Thames in 1862 that Christ Church College Don Charles Dodgson first entertained the 10-year-old Alice Liddell and her sisters with a tale of a girl who fell down a rabbit hole into a world called Wonderland. The sale with Malliam's auctioneers in Oxford is the first opportunity to view the collection in its entirety. Jovic Bermas, UNTV News and Rescue, London, United Kingdom. Paris begins its Retro Mobile Week with a showcase of pricey collections. June Garin will tell us why. A dream collection of vintage cars and motorcycles is presented in Paris on Wednesday ahead of a Bonhams auction which coincides with Retro Mobile Week, a fair that has made Paris a car collector's capital. Over 100 cars produced over a period ranging from the turn of the last century to the 1990s were on display under the stately glass roof of the Grand Palais. In 1901, the Grand Palais welcomed the first Paris Motor Show and now over 100 years later, a selection of 133 vintage cars are up for grabs. The old timers are still in pristine condition. It is worth taking note as well of their history and pedigree, as described by Bottoms International Director of Business Development and Head of European Motor Cars, Philip Cantor. Stars of the show, I suppose the Aston Martin Ulster, beautiful 1935 Aston Martin, 31 produced, 28 still survive. The car ran at Le Mans 35 and finished fifth in its class. Very historic car, very nice car today because it's eligible for a uh, multitude of events. The pre-war Aston Martin Ulster Sports is estimated to fetch between 1.6 and 1.8 million euros or 1.7 to 1.9 million dollars. While the Bentley S1 is estimated between 1 and 1.5 million euros or 1.07 to 1.6 million dollars. Bids for the Mercedes-Benz could range from 1.1 to 1.3 million euros or 1.18 to 1.4 million dollars. Cantor says he believed there would always be a demand for collector's cars no matter what the future brings. The first word is nostalgia, for sure. We all want to have what we saw when we were young, uh, which we couldn't afford. So that's uh, one part of it. The other part is that you're actually investing in a tangible asset, which is fun. You can use it, you can enjoy it, you can drive it, you can look at it, you, can, uh, you get pleasure from it, uh, more than from a stock uh, or from something in your bank account. The auction will take place on Thursday afternoon, February 9, and Cantor expects a full house with some bids to be made over telephone. June Garin, UNTV News and Rescue, Paris, France. Those are the reasons behind the news. February 9, 2017. I am Angelo Castro III. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I'm Darlene Basingan. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Thank you for watching. Bye news.